Now it's time for the last word with my friend Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening to you, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And uh, for anyone out there who hasn't heard enough from Alex, uh, from uh, Andrew Weissman tonight, uh, he's coming up here because, uh, as you know, Alex, there's so much to cover yes. in tonight's Defendant Trump news uh, from New York to Florida. And uh, Andrew's going to join us for that. Well, there is. I, I wanted to keep him on for the whole hour, so I'm glad he's in yours. I, I know the feeling. I know that feeling very well. <laughs> Have a good show. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Well, our breaking news tonight, federal judge Aileen Mercedes Cannon, who was appointed by Donald Trump, denied a motion to dis dismiss the criminal case against Donald Trump filed by Special Prosecutor Jack Smith, alleging Donald Trump violated the Espionage Act by illegally possessing classified documents and other government documents after he left the presidency. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith and Donald Trump were both in the front row of the courtroom today while Judge Cannon heard arguments from both sides on the Trump motion to dismiss. Donald Trump did not have to be there, but he was there in the front row, in effect, dangling a Supreme Court nomination in front of his trial judge. Judge Cannon knows that her future as a Trump appointee to the United States Supreme Court depends on how she handles this case and what voters do on Election Day. And so far, she has been handling this case in every way she possibly could to please Donald Trump. If Donald Trump wins the presidency again, he would surely approach then 76-year-old Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas with an offer he couldn't refuse. Leave the Supreme Court so Donald Trump can replace him with a younger conservative like Judge Cannon. And Clarence Thomas gets a beautiful, brand new, custom built to his specifications, motorhome, the most expensive one in the world, surely complete with vulgar, gold-plated, Trump-style faucets, and as much private travel as Clarence Thomas could possibly want on Donald Trump's private planes and other corporate private planes, and massive amounts of money from Republican billionaires who will put Clarence Thomas on their boards. That offer, almost as specific of the, as that, was floating right there in the air, in the room between Donald Trump and Judge Cannon, right there where anyone with an understanding of Donald Trump could see it, very much including Judge Cannon. And so, when she wrote a two-page order a couple of hours after the hearing denying Donald Trump's preposterous motion for dismissal, claiming that the law is too vague, she wrote her order in the most favorable possible terms to Donald Trump. She denied the motion without prejudice, meaning Donald Trump is allowed and actually, according to Judge Cannon, encouraged to bring up the same issue again later in the process. The judge did say that one of the points in the process where this motion could be revived is during jury selection, saying that it could, quote, be raised as appropriate in connection with jury instruction, briefing, and or other appropriate motions. Judge Cannon did not rule on a, on a second ground for dismissal that the Trump lawyers argued today involving Donald Trump's claim that the government documents in Donald Trump's possession belonged to Donald Trump. They argued that the Presidential Re Records Act allows a president to designate as personal some documents, and Donald Trump designated all of them. According to his lawyers, Judge Cannon did say, I am not seeing how any of that leads to a dismissal of the indictment. Leading off our discussion tonight, Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. Also with us, Andrew Weissman, former FBI General Counsel and former Chief of the Criminal Division in the Eastern District of New York. And Bradley Moss is with us, a national security attorney who represents people working in the intelligence community. Uh, and Andrew, uh, let me just go to your reading of the judge's order here, which, which in my reading included almost the encouragement that they bring this issue up again. This was the worst possible outcome for the government, because if the judge had simply said, 
uh, I agree with Donald Trump, and I find that this is vague, and I'm dismissing it. The government could have appealed it to the Eleventh Circuit, as they have done twice before and won twice before. And that is something that uh, this judge is trying to avoid at all cost. Um, but she also did not want to rule in favor of the government. So what she did is said, you know what, why don't you bring this up later? I think there's some real issues here. And so she sort of flagged that. And there will be a lot of complications if she deals with this after a jury is sworn in this case, because that, that is the key moment where double jeopardy attaches, um, and there are various legal consequences to that. So this is the worst possible decision for the government. And by kicking it down the road and saying, but I still may decide in Donald Trump's favor later, um, she has sort of avoided the sort of Damocles of the Eleventh Circuit, um, but she has not given the government what they clearly, as you pointed out, deserve, because there is nothing vague about the statute. People are in jail all over, as Bradley knows, for violating this statute. Uh, Neil, your, your reading of what happened in that courtroom today and the, and the ensuing judgment. Yeah, I think Andrew is basically right that, you know, there were definitely, um, I think, much better outcomes for the government, including even possibly just a straight loss that would allow them to take the appeal. But on the other hand, you know, the Judge Cannon did basically suggest that this isn't vague, or at least not vague enough at this moment in time. Now, you know, that is a win for the government, but it is only a temporary win and not a huge one. And my fear, Lawrence, is that this is going to be a win for Jack Smith in the same way as like the win will be once the Supreme Court decides the absolute immunity case that they're hearing on April 25th. I think there's no chance the United States Supreme Court is going to side with Trump on absolute immunity. But the court, by having such a delayed schedule, gave Donald Trump what he wants, which is a very realistic possibility he can delay the case past the election. That's basically what Cannon has done here, too, kicking the can down the road. I mean, Lawrence, she had a full day hearing about these two legal issues, which were thoroughly absurd. I mean, really, the only thing Donald Trump's arguments merit is an eye roll and a swift denial and not this kind of, you know, belabored one day hearing and the like. And every time she has these hearings, it delays the day of reckoning for Donald Trump, which is all he wants, because if he can stretch this past the election, he can order the Justice Department to drop this prosecution. Uh, and Bradley Moss, given uh, the, the history of the Espionage Act and the use of it uh, in criminal cases, uh, ha has this ever been raised before that it's too vague uh, to use in prosecution? Every single criminal defendant, as far as I know, who's ever been prosecuted under the Espionage Act brings this same motion. They all argue it's unconstitutional, it's too vague, it can't be applied like this, and they all fail. Judges over and over in multiple district courts across the country have always rejected this argument. And what concerns me, and this is kind of following up a bit on what Andrew was saying, is Judge Cannon's failing to meet the moment here. Look, this is going to be one of the most monumental cases she's ever going to handle. There's been a number of cases over the last decade all tied up with you know Donald Trump one way or another, where judges have had to put their name in a moment in history and say, here's my view on the law, right or wrong. Here's how I'm assessing it. She keeps punting. She keeps bobbing and weaving, trying to push it off onto somebody else to make the tough choice. She's trying to push off some of this into potentially being a jury issue, making 12 ordinary Americans try to evaluate things that lawyers far smarter than me argue over every single day, and that was going to stick it onto a jury. This is her job. She's going to have to rule on this as a matter of law, or she's going to be putting way too much burden on this jury. Uh, and Andrew, you know, it never occurred to anyone in a uh, in a confirmation, a, a judicial confirmation hearing to ask the question, uh, will you recuse yourself from criminal cases involving the president who uh, appointed you? Because, of course, it's never happened in history. But here we are. And here the country is watching this grotesquerie of a Trump 
appointed judge, leaning in every way she possibly can in favor of the man who appointed her to her judgeship, the most glaring and poisonous conflict of interest you could ask for uh, in a federal courtroom, because it also contains now this dynamic of her judicial future if Donald Trump were somehow to win the Electoral College again. Uh, which is obviously dangling in the air there in in its totally obscene way. So I agree with you that that what she is doing and her behavior and the fact that she has been reversed twice for not just sort of making minor errors, but really significant errors and all of the things that she has done uh, you know, consistently is one sided. Um, raises all of the things that you say. But I think there's sort of two victims here. One is the public, which is entitled to a speedy and fair trial here, um, at which the defendant is accorded due process. But the other is something worth remembering, which is there are judges appointed by Donald Trump who are really good judges who take their oaths seriously. There are judges appointed by Republican presidents who um, rule against Republicans. There are judges appointed by Democrats who rule against Democrats. Why? Because they act on principle. And so one of the things that she has done is made it, unfortunately, extremely relevant to ask that question of who appointed you, because it's hard to see any other explanation for the way that she has behaved, even with trying to think of, well, is it just inexperience? And I think that she has shown over and over again that that is not a consistent explanation for how she is behaving in the way she is handling this case. Yeah, and Neil, we all remember, well, some of us remember, uh, the, the most important uh, Supreme Court case involving a president of the United States, which involved criminal behavior, uh, was Richard Nixon, and it was a unanimous Supreme Court opinion ordering him to turn over those tapes, which ultimately ended his presidency, and for which he needed a pardon uh, after leaving the presidency so that he wouldn't be prosecuted. And at least four of those judges, I believe it was, it was three, three of them at least, were appointed by Richard Nixon. And at the time, no no one had an issue with that. No one's faith was, was shaken in the possibility that judges appointed by Nixon would be deciding Nixon's fate. But this, this point in the 21st century is another world. Yeah, it's a, I think you're exactly right to think about Nixon, because there, I think there was a concern that the three Nixon appointees would side with Nixon just out of loyalty, and none, and they didn't. I think only just then Justice Rehnquist did at that time. And you know that is something I want to pick up on something Andrew said. That is the historic role of, of the federal judiciary. I had the privilege of clerking for Justice Stephen Breyer the year after he was nominated to the Supreme Court by Bill Clinton, and we had the Paula Jones case, and he ruled against Bill Clinton on the Paula Jones case, despite all of the politics and all of the pressure uh, and the like. Um, I remember when the Affordable Care Act was being argued, and it was Chief Justice Roberts who cast the deciding vote to save Obamacare, obviously handing a huge victory to Barack Obama right before the 2012 election. That's what judges do. And by the way, Lawrence, that's what the Court of Appeals did to Judge Cannon. It was three Republican appointees uh, who reversed Judge Cannon twice last year in stark language, including a Trump appointee. So, you know, this is the way the federal judiciary is supposed to operate. And my, you know, deep, deep hope uh, is that that can still happen here. Yeah, and this is uh, going to be one of those rare moments. Everybody should record it. It should uh, go to the Museum of Broadcasting. I'm going to not correct Neil Katyal on a Supreme Court matter. I'm going to add a footnote to the reference to uh, Justice Rehnquist. Uh, he recused himself from the right. Nixon uh, case. So it was an 8-0 unanimous decision. But there was nothing that would indicate that if he hadn't recused himself, he wouldn't have joined that majority. Uh, and, and, and Bradley, uh, that point of, Nick, of, of Rehnquist's recusal, it makes it 
it, it kind of goes to making my point here uh, about Cannon and why she absolutely is someone who should have recused herself. And, and even, even recognizing her own complete lack of experience and uh, an ability to handle a case like this. Yeah, and it really makes you wonder how she's going to handle these other motions that are still pending that she's dragging her feet on. You know, leading up into the segment tonight, you know, Andrew and I were joking about various Yiddish terms to refer to some of these things. I look at some of these pretrial motions that Donald Trump has filed, especially with the Presidential Records Act, which was up today in this hearing. It's a schmageggy. It's nonsense. <laughs> there is no, no possible realistic idea that this could possibly ever be viable. But she gave it this full day hearing, and we still don't have a ruling on it. And that becomes the concern, whether it's, you know, simply inexperience, you know, whether it's bias or whether she's just not meeting the moment. She's not addressing this in the manner in which she should as a, as a U.S. District Court judge, and she's not putting meat on the bones for these rulings. Stop kicking the can down the road. Make a decision. Put your name on it. And let the chips fall where they may. And the last word on this one is shmageggy, uh, which I don't know how to spell. And, and Neil, in the interest of full disclosure, when you said that point about Rehnquist, I wrote a little note to myself here, which I can prove, I can hold it up, saying Rehnquist recused, and I was wonder, I wasn't completely sure. But uh, our crack executive producer, uh, Melissa Ryerson, came into my ear and said Rehnquist recused. And so we weren't relying completely on my memory, which is not better than Joe Biden's or anyone else's out there. Uh, and that's how we got to that fact. Uh, but that's, that's never going to happen again. It's that, and I don't, I don't think it's a correction, Neil. It's really just a, a footnote to, to what you said, isn't it? Absolutely. And I appreciate yeah. the uh, correction. I'm preparing for a Supreme Court argument now, so my head's in a different place on Nixon versus <laughs> United States from 1974. Right. Uh, well, there was that great trial lawyer line about uh, about a, a, a lawyer. is. It's like being in a bathtub. They pull the plug after each case and they forget everything that they knew in the previous case so they can make room. Uh, for the next one. Uh, Bradley Moss, thank you very much for Schmageggi. Uh, we'll be, <laughs> we invite you to uh, add to our vocabularies in any future segments on this subject. Andrew and Neil are going to stay with us for what we're going to do next, which is Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg saying today that newly received evidence in the criminal case against Donald Trump for his hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels, who, by the way, prefers to be referred to as a porn star. That's why I do it. It's her preference. I used to refer to her as an actress, but she prefers porn star. Uh, anyway, that case could require a 30-day delay in the trial, uh, which was scheduled to start just 11 days from now. That's next. Today, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg suggested a 30-day delay in the start of the criminal trial of Donald Trump for business fraud and Donald Trump's hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels. The district attorney said that some delay in the start of the, tr of the trial is reasonable because of recently obtained evidence from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan who investigated the same criminal payoff scheme when they obtained a guilty plea from Donald Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, who arranged for the delivery of Donald Trump's payoffs to Stormy Daniels. In a filing in the case today, the district attorney said that the delay Donald Trump's lawyers are requesting of 90 days is too long, but 30 days would be reasonable, quote, because of the production since March 4th of approximately 73,000 pages of records by the United States Attorney's Office. These records were produced in response to defendants' January 18th, 2024 subpoena to that office. Yesterday, the United States Attorney's Office produced approximately 31,000 pages of additional records and represented that there will be another production of documents by next week. The district attorney suggested that so far, only 172 pages of that material appears relevant to the case. The district attorney blamed Donald Trump's lawyers for the delay in obtaining the evidence, saying, quote, defendant waited until January 18th, 2024 to subpoena additional materials from the United States Attorney's Office and then consented to repeated extensions of the deadline for the United States Attorney's Office determination. The timing of the United States Attorney's Office productions 
is a result solely of defendants' delay despite the people's diligence. Neil Katyal and Andrew Weissman are back with us. And Neil, one is, it leaves one wondering why the Justice Department moved as slowly as it did, even though Trump, Trump's lawyers were not pressuring them. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, Lawrence, I mean, one step forward, two steps back seems to be the mantra of all of these Trump trials. And it is incredibly frustrating how Donald Trump gets lucky. I mean, it's not just luck because his whole strategy is to push delay at every turn. Here, I think, you know, there's questions to be asked about why Donald Trump waited until January of 2024, just last month, to seek these documents. So that's one question. But another is, you know, why didn't the U.S. Attorney's Office turn this over last year? Um, is it just that they were, you know, sitting on their hands? Was it there, that there was a possible other open investigation and so they couldn't turn these materials over? We don't know. The thing we do know is that once again, Donald Trump's trial is being delayed. And, you know, I, I am really concerned that we're getting close to the election and these really important criminal trials, whether it's January 6th or Mar-a-Lago, like we were talking about earlier, or this trial, which involves, you know, serious campaign finance abuse, uh, it, all, all of these, you know, are looking more and more in jeopardy. And, Andrew, a 30-day delay in, a, in an approaching trial uh, is usually not a big deal, especially if there's newly discovered material like this that has to be reviewed. It's not something that uh, either side worries very much about. And, and, and yet, when, with all of this litigation under the microscope, we do have to wonder how it came to this in this situation. Yeah. Um, so I think there's two things. There's looking backwards and looking forward. So looking backwards, there's no question that there are a lot of issues as to what on God's green earth was the Southern District of New York thinking when they did not turn over all inculpatory and exculpatory information to the DA's office when they asked for it. That is sort of the looming question on looking backwards. Looking forwards, the problem is we don't know what um, information is in the 31,000 documents that have been turned over. We've heard that a lot of it is irrelevant, but not all of it is relevant. And there, as you pointed out, there's still more to come. That means that there could be information that the defense is going to use for a further delay, because they have not seen that. Um, that is true, as Neil said, that part of this is their um, fault for not subpoenaing this earlier. But be that as may, the judge is going to want to make sure they have an opportunity to look at this. So we have to wait and see, is there going to be additional delay because of what the Southern District of New York did in not turning this over when asked by another law enforcement agency who was right down the road from them, um, where it was incumbent on them to cooperate with them? And, Neil, uh, the, the district attorney does say that they asked for this stuff a long time ago, but seems to try, at least, to entirely blame the delay on the Trump lawyers. Yeah, that's their move. And, you know, maybe that's right. But I do have to say I have some skepticism now about the Southern District of New York's um, handling of this entire matter. I mean, back in 2018, they refused to prosecute Donald Trump and only prosecuted his lawyer, Michael Cohen, for these crimes. And then once Biden came into office, they refused to prosecute Biden again. And now there seems to be some sort of unexplained delay in turning these documents over. So I don't know what's happening here. I do, you know, but I do think that Andrew's absolutely right. The culmination of all this is at least a 30 day delay, and if not more. And Donald Trump deserves a fair trial. And if, you know, a bunch of these documents are relevant to his defense or relevant to the prosecution, he's going to get a delay because of that. And, and Andrew, quickly before we go, uh, what is the likelihood of Merrick Garland being either involved in the delay or being aware of the delay? It's possible, but I just don't think it's likely. Um, the Southern District of New York is an independent United States attorney's office. Of course, it does report up to the deputy attorney general and the attorney general. But in a matter like this, it's not clear to me it really would have gone that high. And I also just 
this is just not the kind of thing that I could see Merrick Garland doing. Um, that's that's just there may be issues that people have, but this is this just does not smack of something that he would do. Andrew Weissman and Neil Katyal, thank you for joining our discussions. And Andrew Weissman and Melissa Murray will be hosting a special tomorrow night at this hour. The Trump indictments. That's at 10 p.m. right here on MSNBC. That's based on their new best-selling book. And coming up today, Vice President Kamala Harris made history as the first president or vice president to visit an abortion clinic. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who didn't have an abortion clinic to visit, when she was a 16-year-old who needed one, will join us next. I'm here at this health care clinic to uplift the work that is happening in Minnesota as an example of what true leadership looks like, which is to understand it is only right and fair that people have access to the health care they need, and that they have access to health care in an environment where they are treated with dignity and respect. Today, in the sixth stop on her Fight for Reproductive Freedoms tour, as they're calling it, Vice President Harris became the first vice president or president to visit a clinic that provides abortion services. The vice president met with health care providers during a tour of Planned Parenthood in St. Paul, Minnesota. Part of this health care crisis is the clinics like this that have had to shut down. And what that has meant to leave no options with any reasonable geographic area for so many women who need this essential care. And again, it runs the gamut of reproductive health care. So yes, it is abortion care. It is also, as I mentioned earlier, essential and critical reproductive health care like PAPs, like breast cancer screenings, things of that nature. So I'm here to highlight that of the many, I believe, potentially intended consequences of the Dobbs decision, one of them has been for health care providers such as this in the states that have banned or outlawed access to reproductive care. State clinics like this to shut down, and it's a travesty. Most of the health care services Planned Parenthood provides are breast cancer screenings and preventive health care. In this environment, these attacks against an individual's right to make decisions about their own body are outrageous and in many instances just plain old immoral. How dare these elected leaders believe they are in a better position to tell women what they need, to tell women what is in their best interest. We have to be a nation that trusts women. Three years ago, our next guest, Democratic Representative Barbara Lee, told the House of Representatives what was coming if Roe versus Wade were overturned. But I'm compelled to speak out because of the real risks of the clock being turned back to those days before Roe versus Wade, to the days when I was a teenager and had a back alley abortion in Mexico. Adolescent sexual and reproductive health were not discussed in a meaningful way, and because of that, I honestly wasn't sure how you got pregnant. When I just turned 16, I missed my period. I was confused, afraid, and unsure, not knowing if I was pregnant or not. I didn't know what to do. Now, in those days, mind you, this is in the mid-1960s, women and girls were told, if you didn't have a period, you should take quinine pills, sit in a tub of water, or use a coat hanger if nothing else worked. My mother noticed I became introverted and very quiet, so she asked me what was going on with me. At that point, I told her everything. I told her that I maybe, maybe not could be pregnant. She responded with love. One of my mother's best friends in El Paso helped me access the, the abortion I could not get in California. When my mother told her what was going on, she told my mother to send me to her in El Paso because she knew of a good, competent, and compassionate doctor, yes, who had a back alley clinic in Mexico. Now, I was one of the lucky ones, Madam Chair. A lot of girls and women in my generation didn't make it 
They died from unsafe abortions. Joining us now is Democratic Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California. She is the co-chair of the Congressional Pro-Choice Caucus. Congresswoman Lee, thank you very much for joining us tonight for this important discussion. And I imagine uh, at, even at that time when you told your own personal story about this, there might have been people listening to that who thought, oh, we could never go back to that. Lawrence, thank you very much for um, having me with you tonight. Uh, and there were uh, women and men who were surprised um, that I talked about an abortion that I had. I never talked about it before, Lawrence. And it, it, I think the message and the lesson there in terms of my coming forward was that that's a personal, and it was a personal decision. It was nobody's business. It was about my body. And it was about my mother and I making the decision that um, I would have an abortion. And mind you, uh, it was illegal in California, illegal in Texas, and it really was illegal in Mexico. Uh, and I knew that I could be just like now criminalized, but I also knew that I could die because the highest rate of deaths were during that time were caused, especially as it relates to black women, septic abortions. For Thank God I, I survived. But uh, here we are today in 2024, and I'm so happy and proud of the vice president for shining a light on the devastating effects of the uh, Dobbs decision, but also the importance of making sure that Donald Trump is not elected. One of the points she made today in Minnesota is that Minnesota has become, and St. Paul has become, uh, the new El Paso uh, for some girls and women uh, in neighboring states where they do not have any access to abortion whatsoever, and they have to make that trip. Uh, talk about what it's like for, for what it was like for you at 16 and what it's like for women and girls who, who actually have to make an interstate trip, a real trip for, to, in order to handle something like this. Well, it, it's terrifying. First of all, I went by myself. Uh, my mother was working. And I'll never forget, that was my very first uh, airplane ride uh, from, uh, I believe it was Burbank into El Paso. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I was one of the lucky ones because you know what? My, my mother and my family could afford it. Now, so many women, uh, especially women of color, low-income women, they don't have the money. They're low-wage workers in these red states and in these a dozen plus states that have, have these restrictive laws. They don't have the resources for childcare. They can't take off of work. How are they going to travel to another state? And so, you know, it's a double whammy for them. And it's a really hard uh, life uh, if, in fact, they want to just exercise their own uh, bodily autonomy uh, to have to be able to travel to a state with no money to find uh, an abortion clinic. And I wanna thank the abortion clinics in the states that are welcoming and helping these women because so many of them are low income, so many of them are black and brown women. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, thank you very much for joining us for this important discussion. My pleasure and thank you for having it. Thank you. And coming up today, the highest ranking elected Jewish official in the United States. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer delivered an impassioned speech on the Senate floor proclaiming his love for Israel and his heartbreak for the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza while outlining a peace plan in direct opposition to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. That's next. People on all sides of this war are turning away from a two-state solution, including Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who in recent weeks has said out loud repeatedly what many have long suspected by outright rejecting the idea of Palestinian statehood and sovereignty. As the highest-ranking Jewish elected official in our government and as a staunch defender of Israel, I rise today to say unequivocally, this is a grave mistake for Israel, for Palestinians, for the region, and for the world. There is no stronger support of is, or supporter of Israel in the United States Senate than Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the first Jewish leader of the United States Senate. We love Israel in our bones. 
What Israel has meant to my generation within living memory of the Holocaust is impossible to measure. The flowering of the Jewish people in the desert from the ashes of the Holocaust and the fulfillment of the dream of a Jewish homeland after nearly 2,000 years of praying and waiting represents one of the most heartfelt causes of my life. What Hamas did on October 7th was brutal beyond imagination. I have sat with the families of those killed in the assault. I have seen the footage and heard the stories of innocents murdered and raped in heartless cruelty. And as long as I live, I will never forget these images, this pure and premeditated evil. My heart also breaks at the loss of so many civilian lives in Gaza. I'm anguished that the Israeli war campaign has killed so many innocent Palestinians. I know that my fellow Jewish Americans feel the same anguish when they see the images of dead and starving children and destroyed homes. Gaza is experiencing a humanitarian catastrophe. Entire families wiped out, whole neighborhoods reduced to rubble, mass displacement, children suffering. We should not let the complexities, complexities of this conflict stop us from stating the plain truth. Palestinian civilians do not deserve to suffer for the sins of Hamas, and Israel has a moral obligation to do better. The United States has an obligation to do better. Today, Senator Schumer reached the breaking point with Benjamin Netanyahu and what Senator Schumer called the extremists in the Netanyahu government. I will always respect his extraordinary bravery for Israel on the battlefield as a younger man. I believe in his heart he has his highest priority is, as is the security of Israel. However, I also believe Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Nobody expects Prime Minister Netanyahu to do the things that must be done to break the cycle of violence to preserve Israel's credibility on the world stage and to work towards a two-state solution. At this critical juncture, I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel. Joining our discussion now is Ben Rhodes, who served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama, and Richard Stengel, former Under Secretary of State during the Obama administration. They are both MSNBC political analysts. And uh, Rick, uh, I'd like you to just speak for a moment as uh, someone who grew up the way Chuck Schumer did as a, a member of the greater New York Jewish community and what it must have felt like. Uh, for Chuck Schumer to have to go out on the Senate floor today and make that speech? I thought it was a very powerful speech, Lawrence. I thought he spoke for many Americans, not just Jewish Americans, but other Americans who are supporters for Israel. He spoke out of love for Israel. As you said, he's been the most staunch supporter of Israel in the U.S. Senate. But one of the things that he said that spoke to me was this idea that Israel cannot survive if it's a pariah nation. He's speaking about our children, our children's children, and what they will have to undergo if Israel doesn't change course. Uh, the fact that he called for an election in Israel is quite extraordinary, but he was doing it out of his concern that the course that Israel is on under Benjamin Netanyahu will turn it into a pariah nation. And he spoke also for all of us about the humanitarian catastrophe, as he called it, of what the people of Gaza most of whom are innocent, most of whom are not supporters of, of Hamas, are going through. That's a crisis that we have to do something about. And Ben Rhodes, he uh, delivered all of this within the context of a peace plan. It, it, this was not just uh, 
a critique of the current situation. He's trying to build a po positive steps toward a police peace plan, including uh, a, a what he wants is a temporary ceasefire uh, immediately uh, in order to get hostages out, but also other elements to the peace plan, which include he, a, a demand, a hope for new leadership, both in Israel and new Palestinian leadership. Yeah, and I think there are two elements to this. I mean, the first is there's enormous frustration in the United States about the Israeli government's refusal to listen to anything that they're hearing from uh, the United States, particularly as it relates to continuing this military operation into the city of Rafah, which has over a military, million Palestinians and could be uh, an exponentially even greater humanitarian catastrophe. But then also, I think critically, the Netanyahu coalition which includes the most far-right members of a cabinet that we've ever seen in Israel's history, uh, literally. Uh, clearly, their purpose is to prevent a Palestinian state from ever being a possibility. We know this because they tell us this. Bibi Netanyahu tells us this. Some of his key ministers tell us this. And I think what Chuck Schumer realizes is if we don't stand up and have people like him, who have so much credibility in Israel and the American Jewish community, speaking out on behalf of preserving the possibility of a Palestinian state, the possibility of a two-state solution, it, it could die. Uh, this could be killed mm -hmm. in the next few months, along with, uh, obviously, so many people in Gaza. And so I think those two things led him to this breaking point of Netanyahu is not listening to us, and uh, he's a part of a rather extremist project here, which is to ensure that there never can be a Palestinian state. And, uh, Rick, it's very clear, uh, Donald Trump, Trump, Trump's position on this is that Netanyahu uh, should finish the job. That's his phrase, finish the job in Gaza. In other words, Donald Trump doesn't want to inhibit uh, anything that the Israeli military is doing. He does, he's not interested in any form of ceasefire, nothing like that. Uh, so Netanyahu knows uh, that the president who's going to be, who would be most favorable to him, the winner of the presidential election that would be most favorable to him would be Donald Trump. Yes, Lawrence, that was, in fact, the subtext of Schumer's remarks. I mean, remember, he said the reason that Netanyahu is an obstacle to peace is because he regards his own preservation as the leader of Israel more important than securing peace for Israel. One way that he wants to kick the can down the road is to try to survive until Donald Trump would be elected. That's something that maybe he has in his back pocket. That's one of the things that Schumer was thinking about when he said, look, we need to have elections uh, in Israel soon. That's unorthodox, but that's what he was thinking about. Uh, ben, what are the prospects of elections in Israel soon? Well, I think they're quite possible, because keep in mind, uh, Bibi Netanyahu is at historic levels of unpopularity. Since October 7th, a lot of Israelis rightly blame him for taking the ball, uh, taking his eye off the ball in Gaza, being distracted from the threat posed by Hamas, moving some of the IDF that would have been along that border up to the West Bank uh, to defend settlers who were picking fights with Palestinians up there, because that's part of what his coalition was doing. Also distracting and dividing the country with his efforts to undermine Israeli democracy by trying to essentially neuter the Supreme Court in Israel. So already you saw really plummeting popularity levels for Netanyahu. And I think there's a lot of belief from people that if there were an election uh, in Israel, there would be a different course taken, a uh, different leadership uh, chosen. And, and essentially, Rhodes, Netanyahu's uh, political survival kind of ahead. includes perpetuating the war. Mm -hmm. Ben Rhodes and Rick Stengel, thank you very much for joining us on this important subject. Thank you.